David Clements and uh, is a professor at Trinity Western University, weed scientist, longtime colleague and friend. And Sarah, pleased to meet you. Fourth year student now this coming year. And Sarah Devane is uh, uh, also at Trinity Western. They will be talking about rivers, climate change, and invasive species threatening the land's lifeblood. All right. Thanks a lot, John. So this work was inspired by a survey we did in last summer, um, led by my student Sarah Damien here on the, the Chilliwack River, which unlike the creek that Edward was talking about, is free flowing, uh, mostly pollution free. But um, as you can see by the picture here, our area in November 2021 was hit by the, wor the worst natural disaster in British Columbia history by monetary costs is the floods of November 2021. So we went to survey the knotweed, which is this invasive species we're going to talk about. You can see in the corner there, that's the result of this. So um, we found it increased the population of knotweed by five times the floods. So I'm going to talk about the relationship between invasive species and climate change and how the uh, rivers is a metaphor for our own circulatory system. And Sarah will explain what happened last summer. As Leviticus says, the life of a creature is in its blood. Likewise, this uh, Canadian writer wrote that rivers are veins of the earth through which the lifeblood returns to the heart. And Roderick Haig Brown was a fly fisherman on the West Coast, and he was also called a green prophet. So this is a picture of a guy I saw fly fishing in Boise, Idaho this year. And as in Boise, much of um, our society and civilization is shaped by rivers. I mean, that's clear from the previous presentation. There's a dynamic reciprocal relationship between river health and civilization, just as there is between the health of, of our bloodstream and us. And we can see intimate connections taking place in these major um, watersheds like the Tigris Euphrates, the Indus, the Huanghe, and the Nile. And the Nile runs through Egypt. And Sarah's going to tell you about her special experience at COP27 in Egypt as well. So a river runs through. It's also the theme of a book and a movie um, written by the son of a Presbyterian minister who wrote, in our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. <laughs> then you have the poetic Psalm 104 talking about rivers, really how important they are for biodiversity, how God waters the mountains um, for the wild donkeys and the birds of the sky, and I would add for the Chilliwack River here, for the salmon. That's really, you know, the, the organism we look at the most. And the land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. But Psalm 104 makes no mention of invasive species. When you put them into the picture, the mitigating effect of biodiversity and climate change is threatened by the invasion. And additionally, climate change often makes the invasive species worse. So what Sarah's drawn out here is a vicious circle. And climate change is clearly making things worse for river health. Um, this is extreme events in the US, but you can see more floods, more storms, more extreme events all the time. It's impossible to ignore these and we've been hit by some serious ones just in recent times last weekend. Nova Scotia was hit by these record breaking floods and the premier of Nova Scotia has been repeating, it was something like three months of precipitation in 24 hours there. And just a few weeks earlier, just a bit south there in Vermont, here's the capital of Vermont inundated by water, which is more water than it received any time except in such a short time. Um, in 2011, they were hit by a tropical storm and this knotweed researcher discovered, this is bad for knotweed, not only because knotweed gets spread by the flooding, but our efforts to deal with the knotweed and clean up also spread the knotweed. So what happened in Chilliwack last year? Well, that's what Sarah's going to talk about. <clears throat> 
The most vulnerable habitats of all include rivers, streams, and lakes in both tropical and temperate regions of the world. And unfortunately, here in North America, we're not exempt from the impacts of a changing climate. BC generally experiences 25 to 30 atmospheric rivers annually. However, large ones can be incredibly problematic. They can carry water to as much as 25 Mississippi rivers. Climate change makes strong atmospheric rivers more likely to be frequent. And the November flooding events that came after a record-breaking heat wave from the summer helped fuel that and strip all vegetation and left burn scars in its path. And this created prime conditions for landslides. So in what I was mentioning was in November 2021, southwestern British Columbia experienced two strong atmospheric rivers. And atmospheric rivers are long, narrow rivers of moisture that carry water from tropical areas to towards the poles. When the atmospheric rivers reach southwestern BC, they release their moisture as intense rain, and this resulted in severe flooding, landslides, and loss of life for both people and animals. This natural disaster was the most expensive in the history of BC, and that is not even accounting for managing the increase of invasive species that came out of this. Our research team surveyed the Chilak Better River last summer, and we found 1,700 knotweed stands. As Dr. Clement said, that's a five-fold increase from the previous survey that took place in 2019 before the flood. And flooding promotes the spread of knotweeds in multiple ways. So knotweed spreads primarily through its extensive underground rhizome system, and flooding forces the water to break the rhizomes, leading to fragmentation. And these fragmented rhizome pieces can be carried downstream by floodwaters and establish new infestations where they settle in, uh, in uh, um, any suitable areas. And knotweed seeds can also be dispersed by water. So during flooding, the rushing water can transport seeds over long distances. And this allows it also to reach new areas and establish new populations and when it can stay in the sediment flooding, new subsequent flooding that occurs can also lead to new growth. Um, so it's really a cycle of continuous growth through any water form. So our research team surveyed the whole section that you're seeing present here last summer. And this GIF is flipping between 2021 and 2022. You'll notice that the flooding of 2021 actually altered the course of the river and provided new pathways for knotweed to spread. Pay special attention to the center here in this GIF. Notice the major areas where the course has changed and trees or river that was previously in place is now barren land and been cleared. And also the islands that you're seeing in green are now full of serious wood debris. As we were surveying it, we had to climb over tons of broken trees. The change in this section appears a bit more subtle, but look at all the barren land showing what used to be occupied by trees before it took course, especially on the left side there, where it went kind of scooped under, and then in the 2022 version you'll see in a second just goes above. Now, Dr. Clements will discuss climate change and invasive species on more of a global scale. So we don't want to limit our discussion to little old British Columbia. We're going to go global here. And uh, I just finished editing this book, which came out last year, Global Plant Invasions. And it's evident that there is a lot of increase in invasive plants through the world. And a lot of it's through evolutionary strategies the plants have. And another knotweed student in my worked on this uh, scheme of different evolutionary strategies these plants have. And um, you can read them on the right side. There's six we came up with here. And guess what? Knotweed follows all six of these. So not surprisingly, it's gone global from its original distribution in uh, Japan and China over there. Interestingly, uh, if you notice Chile was on the map there, um, Brian Colloran, the guy I talked about earlier, also worked with these colleagues in Chile and talked about it as an ecosystem engineer, knotweed, because his graphic model explains feedback cycles created by the knotweed damaging riparian areas and rivers enabled it to design its own degraded stream banks. So 
not weed, perfect weed here. It's likewise causing trouble in Quebec. You can see the watershed on the left pretty well infested with knotweed, and that was um, about the same size as the Chilliwack River. And then they did a study on the Etchemin River to look at what, what if after a flood you quickly dig up the little pieces that, that we saw last summer, and they found it was economical for where there's not that many, but in the middle section of the river where there was a lot, it just was not economically feasible. And likewise, there's um, havoc caused in all over Europe with knotweed. So it really is a global kind of problem. So that's one species. There's other species too, of course. One that I've studied in China um, is mile a minute. True to its name, grows quickly, has fragments that go down rivers, like the river you see me standing beside. And um, my colleague, Fudu Zheng, on the left here, who invited me to all this work in China, he's been working with all the um, Asian countries there that are on the Mekong River because the Mekong River is a major conduit of mile a minute weed. And the Mekong River is highly altered by humans. So the other question is, if we alter the rivers, like we saw the creek in the previous uh, talk, um, does that affect the uh, invasive species? Um, here you see the Colorado River, which is basically being drained dry. This is uh, the Mead Reservoir during a very dry period. Um, and this is a plant that takes advantage of the southwestern United States um, river situation. Um, the recruitment occurs through rhizome fragments, just like with knotweed, and flooding and the use of bulldozers to try and deal with it. It laughs in the face of these kind of things. It, it does even better. And these are some warnings from a paper that just came out this month. Invasions have been facilitated by human-aided dispersal of plants and favored by human alteration of riparian ecosystems, especially by damming. So this all increases the invasion risk. So this is to give you a very gloomy picture um, and moving to the next step from someone inspired in Egypt, uh, we're going to hear what our response should be. In November 2022, a year after the atmospheric rivers that flooded southwestern BC, I attended UNFCCC's COP27, um, Conference of the Parties that took place in Egypt. And I was with the Christian Climate Observers Program, CCOP, and I had the most incredible experience with them. So this photo here was taken between week one and two on the Red Sea with Bill McKibben and Catherine Hayhoe to people who've done incredible work in the climate action field. I shared on the C um, SCA, CSCA's Facebook page last year that um, a bit about my experience and how it was transformational for me as a Christian environmental advocate who happens to be half Egyptian. I had the privilege of hearing stories from people that came from all over the world discuss what they've been doing within their country for climate action. Additionally, I heard of hardships that people were facing, and these were devastating problems that occurred whether they understand or accept the link between climate change or not. I met with wonderful people from Pakistan who for the five months prior had been dealing with a de devastating and disastrous flood that submerged one third of their country in water, displaced 8 million people and killed and injured 15,000 people. Homes, bridges, highways, and agricultural land were all destroyed from the record amount of rain. Hearing firsthand stories from people who lost so much was difficult, but it made it so clear how our cities were designed for climate situations that are rapidly becoming outdated. And without stabilizing the composition of our atmosphere, we don't know what standards we need to redesign our cities in the face of ever more powerful storms, more disastrous floods, and longer lasting heat waves. Caring about the impact of climate change is often viewed as political radicalization. The Bible tells us to love God and love our neighbors. Loving one another is Christian discipleship. How can we love our neighbors if we choose to stay silent when circumstances that affect their livelihoods and harm their well-being? How can we genuinely say to our neighbors, I believe you, as they share the ways climate change is adversely affecting their families, harming their neighborhoods, and, fail, and we fail to take any action during that time? In what way can we truly love our neighbors if we fail to stand up for their right to clean air and water, 
and a secure and thriving world where they can flourish. While acknowledging the significant contributions that fossil fuel has granted us for human prosperity and well-being, we can still recognize the need to hold fossil fuels accountable and not grant them unrestricted approval indefinitely. We can recognize the role of fossil fuels in unlocking remarkable economic growth while also acknowledging that their continued use poses a threat to that growth through dangerous climate change. Kyle Mayer Chat wrote it best in following Jesus in a warming world. What if, instead of seeking unique privileges for humans, we focus on identifying the distinctive responsibilities that lie upon us? Rather than asking what special privileges does the image of God grant us humans, we can inquire what unique responsibilities does the image of God call forth in humans concerning the rest of creation. When I was on the bus in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt, I was sitting next to an Australian man who asked me why I am a climate advocate. I told him that all the reasons boiled down to the fact that I am a Christian. He kind of laughed at that statement because he thought Christianity has nothing to do with climate change and in fact has always heard from people that their Christianity is the reason that they don't accept climate change. We know that God's love goes beyond just people. It extends to all creation. We understand that Jesus' reign is not characterized by exploitation, extraction, and dominance, but rather by humble service, sacrifice, and a genuine concern for the well-being of those under his rule. Philippians 2, 6-8 teaches us that Jesus, is, Jesus rules through service. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. I know that many of us strive to be like Jesus, and I think our view of creation should be no different or we're doing it wrong. Psalms 104 highlights the significance of our actions and advocacy becoming better stewards of creation. The psalm describes how God's creation, including the earth, rivers, and living creatures, all depend on him for sustenance and care. It emphasizes the interconnectedness and interdependence of the natural world. Psalms 104 suggests that by being conscious of our responsibilities, promoting sustainability, and advocating for the well-being of creation, we can be caretakers of God's handiwork. To become better stewards of watersheds and honor the teachings of Psalms 104, our actions and advocacy can focus on conservation, restoration, and education. Conservation, practicing responsible water usage, and promoting water conservation measures that ensure sustainable availability of water resources for future generations. Restoration, taking part in efforts to restore and rehabilitate damaged watersheds by participating in river cleanups. Education, educate um, communities about the importance of preventing the introduction and spread of invasive species. Train individuals and relevant organizations how to identify invasive species and where to report their findings. Educate others about the interconnectedness of ecosystems and the impact of our actions on these vital natural resources. The earth teaches us that all living things and ecosystems are e interconnected. Similarly, rivers demonstrate the interdependence of various organisms and habitats within watersheds. They show that our actions can have far-reaching consequences, affecting both human and non-human life. The earth also showcases its, showcases its remarkable ability to adapt to changing circumstances. Rivers exhibit resilience and adaptability in response to different conditions, such as varying water levels or environmental changes. changes. This teaches us the importance of adapting our behaviors and practices to protect and preserve watersheds. Rivers remind us that a healthy water and ecosystem requires a harmonious balanced flow of water, nutrients, and energy. Our actions and advocacy should strive for a sustainable balance that ensures the well-being of watersheds and balanced and diverse ecosystems they support. They teach the valuable the valuableness of responsible stewardship and the need to ensure the cleanliness and availability of water resources for the benefit of all creation. Climate activism can feel lonely and fruitless at times. This month, Mad River, Vermont experienced severe flooding that damaged so much infrastructure, but some of the residents banded together and worked to remove the knotweed that was present that carried over from the floods. This is climate activism restoring landscapes to their original and intended state. 
The Knot We Love is an interdisciplinary community of scientific and creative researchers committed to studying and generating awareness about invasive species near waterways in BC. Our projects integrate creative practices and methods with scientific research to explore environmentally conscious solutions for knotweed management and awareness. Thank you. So if, if knotweed is so prodigious, I guess, it's, it's, how do you manage it? And does it interfere with sort of the natural reconstruction processes that would occur in a river like the Chilliwack River? I mean, in some respects, I see that and I go, yeah, big water is going to move the, the river around a little bit. So. I want to say that's an excellent question, brief to the point. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so knotweed can only be kind of managed through use of herbicides. And unfortunately, near waterways, herbicides are restricted. And so what knotweed also and other invasive plants really, as we were showing in that graph, um, showing how climate change is affected by invasive species, it alters the sediment and all the soil that takes place, making it really easy for floods or the course of the river to change through that way because the soil is no longer strong through it. And natural species help the soil to maintain its stable kind of environment and it outcompetes all natural and na native species. So that's why it's making it so easy for floods or other sort of, you know, heat waves to easily take its place and change its course. I appreciate the presentation very much. Uh, question will be directed to the point. There's catastrophic events like floods, then you have to repair the breach. You know, Isaiah 5812 calls us to repair the breach. Mm. It requires big pieces of equipment. Mm. And I also find in Vermont and Massachusetts, equipment can carry pieces of rhizomes mm -hmm. to where they're moved. Yeah. Any thoughts on how to deal with that issue? Because we're trying to repair the breach, but we're carrying the invasive with us. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, a lot of the growth that happens from knotweed or actually a lot of invasive species is through construction because it can be, as you're saying, the rhizomes can be carried in the wheels of, you know, any sort of thing that they're even using to remove it. And the difficulty of knotweed is it often takes five years, both spring and fall application for knotweed to actually be removed. So even if you start managing it, you have to be following and being on top of it. Otherwise, you're just allowing it to spread. And with um, using the big machinery, just kind of digging it out, even if there's like the size of a fingernail left in ground, we can grow the whole thing back up. So maybe spraying down the equipment that's being used is one really effective treatment. We're just, just being aware of the problem, I think. Often we, we're in ignorance that we're carrying around these weeds. Um, we just don't realize it. But if there's greater awareness, hopefully the people operating the machines will be more careful. It's kind of like the, the, uh, kind of like the land equivalent of uh, aquatic invasive plants on your boat, you know, on your trailer. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I'm just curious, has, have they discovered any predators of knotweed that would naturally eat it away? Yeah, there is a, a biological control effort underway in North America now with a um, psyllid insect. And so, but most of us looking at this think it'll have like this much effect, but it's a very small <laughs> insect, but at least it's something, but that's that's the trouble with a lot of these invasive species in their r native range. Knotweed is not a big problem, but it, it's it doesn't seem to have that kind of biological control agents. Here we see it getting eaten by things once in a while, but nothing nothing substantial. Yeah. Breaking donkeys. Donkeys. <laughs> Yeah, I would, actually, I, I have a, uh, not donkeys, but in the Philadelphia area where this is also a humongous problem, um, some places are, are having success with goats. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's actually become really popular. You know, like kids love seeing that. And, and one of the nature areas, they're, they're now selling little, little uh, you know, toy goats and all yeah. sorts of things. <laughs> so the thing with that, too, it's nutritious for the goats and it actually you'd hope it'd be really successful. The problem with it is because the notes, the goats are only eating what's above ground, you're almost encouraging the growth underneath by... Mile a minute. Oh, mile a minute, okay. Oh, different knotweed. Gotcha. Mile a minute. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Which, although we have not been too, but yeah, the goats are yes. getting mild. Yeah. yeah. So, I was thinking that could you, you. But definitely, we actually saw on our field trip um, example of sheep eating buckthorn that, that is successful. So there are some creative solutions out there. Join me in thanking. Sarah, David, thank you so much.